DDCs, digital to digital converters. Why on earth would you want to buy one of these? Obviously you've got to feed your DAC with something. You've got to get the music, digital information from your player to your DAC. Why does it matter how you do that? As long as the data is bit perfect, that it's unaltered, why does it matter how that happens? Hopefully this video is going to clear up a little bit about why the digital source you use does make a difference, the mechanics of that, and I'll be providing some measurements of these devices to show the differences they make. Let's talk about the three things that a DDC can do, and I've got five devices here. Originally this video was going to be a review of the Denifrips Hermes, which was sent in to me by a viewer on HeadFi, Andrew, thank you very much. But I decided actually it's better to talk about DDCs overall and explain the mechanics behind them. So I've got six devices. I have the Denifrips Hermes, which is a $1,000 USB and SPDIF to I2S, AES, and SPDIF converter. I have a Pi2 AES, which is a network streamer that outputs BNC, coax, optical, AES, and I2S. The shit eater, which is a USB to SPDIF converter. A Raspberry Pi, which I have configured as a network streamer, it just outputs USB. And an iFi iGalvanic, which is a USB to USB galvanic isolator. I also have the SMS 200 Ultra, that's a network streamer USB output. I'm going to be talking about that in a different video just because that's doing different things than a normal USB controller does and it deserves its own video. There's a lot of cool stuff going on with that product. I really like that, but it's a bit outside the scope of this video. So there are three aspects that a digital source has. The first is data integrity, is the information that you are giving to your DAC, getting to it unaltered. Are all the bits getting there as the player sent them? Is it bit perfect? Unless you're doing DSP, which there are some digital to digital converters that do that. ADI2, for example, you can use this as a DDC, you can do DSP on it. Cord Hugo M Scaler, that is upsampling the digital information and feeding it to your DAC. That's not what I'm talking about. All of these devices will pass the information bit perfect. Nothing is being changed, the digital information is the same, it's identical. So why does it matter? Well, there are two other factors. The first is electrical noise. A beefy gaming PC is a horrible device to have in an audio chain. It's just about the worst possible thing you can introduce other than a fridge or a microwave. And that electrical noise can have a negative impact on a DAC. At its worst, it can be just outright audible. My Motu M2, for example, I love that thing. It's feature packed, it's brilliant, but it has basically no noise filtering at all. If I'm playing a game and I've got my monitors running on the Motu M2, I can just straight up hear GPU activity coming out of my speakers. The noise is being carried over the USB connection to the device, and it is being then passed through to the outputs. But just because noise isn't audible doesn't mean it's not having an effect. There are some devices which will have filtering to try and lessen it, but it can still impact performance for two reasons. This is an Apple dongle. This is a pretty well measuring DAC, and what I did was I plugged it directly into my PC and I measured the performance. On the left, you can see a graph of harmonic distortion and noise when it's connected directly to my PC. And then I connected it via this little adapter to the iFi iGalvanic, which is a USB 3.0 isolator. It uses an isolation transformer to electrically disconnect the output from the PC and still pass data, not just the power lines, but all of them. So this is a fantastic little device. And on the right, you can see the performance of the DAC when it was connected via this. Nothing else has changed. The cable was the same. The data was the same. The only difference was that this was isolating the DAC from any noise that might be passed from the PC. And as you can see, it had a pretty noticeable difference. Before you go and comment, ah, but it's below 100, I don't care, I can't hear it. That's not what this video is about. This video is not about what's audible, what's not, what makes a difference. That's up to you to decide, and as far as I'm concerned, it's still up for debate, because there's very limited studies, and I think that the ones that have been done have some holes in them. This is just to demonstrate that these make a difference and explain why. Whether it's worth it or not to you is a different question. So that then shows that certain DACs can in fact be negatively impacted by noise from the source. Again, the data is the same, but electrical noise from the source was causing it to perform badly. You can fix that via something like this, which is the iFi iGalvanic, or you can use something much cheaper. This is a Raspberry Pi. This is just a cheap 30 quid or so 
programmable computer. And I'm using an OS called Ropie, which there's a link to in the description. And that allows it to run as a Rune endpoint, a DNLA endpoint, so you can stream to it from FUBAR, you can use HQ Play, anything you like. That's a super cheap and effective way to eliminate noise. But then you also have an optical connection from your PC. You can just run optical from your PC to your DAC. And that's not an electrical connection, so no noise is going to be passed. So why not just use that then? And the answer is jitter. Just because there is no noise, and just because the data itself is intact, the timing with which that data arrives at the DAC matters. On the left of the screen, and I'll put two up actually, so left and right, you can see two illustrations demonstrating how even if the digital samples are identical, the timing with which they are received and converted makes a difference, and if it's particularly bad, it can end up distorting the waveform. Humans are hugely susceptible to time domain differences, much more so than frequency domain distortion and things like that, and so jitter is one of the things which is extremely audible even if there's very, very little of it. So what influences jitter? Inside your DAC, there is a device called a clock, a voltage-controlled crystal oscillator. And that device vibrates with a very, very specific frequency when a specific voltage is passed through it. Some higher-end devices, like this Denfrips Hermes, use something called an oven-controlled crystal oscillator, which is temperature-dependent, not voltage. And that's a little bit of a step up, but for the most part, DACs are going to use VXCOs. The quality of that clock makes a difference, obviously. And if you are using USB, then your DAC is in control of the timing. Your DAC tells the PC when to send more information, it keeps it in a buffer, and the clock in the DAC determines when each sample is converted. That clock is, well, obviously the quality of that clock itself makes a difference. You can have good clocks and bad clocks, but noise, noise itself will make the reference voltage being fed to that clock fluctuate, and that can negatively impact performance. Showing it again with the Apple dongle, on the left you can see the jitter performance. This is not necessarily just total harmonic distortion, this is actual jitter. On the left you can see it with directly connected to the PC, and on the right you can see it with the iFi iGalvanic. As you can see again, much better. None of that then really explains why a Pi 2 AS, a Shit Eater, or a Denifrips Hermes is going to make a damn bit of difference. Why, if you've eliminated any noise for 30 quid, and your DAC's in control of the timing, would you then spend a thousand dollars on a big black box to sit on top of your DAC? And the answer is that with AES, SPDIF, or I2S, your DAC is not in control of the timing, the source is. And that means you can potentially upgrade the performance by using a device with better clocks than your DAC has internally, or at least better jitter performance overall than the USB implementation in your DAC has, because the clocks themselves, as you'll see in a moment, are only a small part of the story. Your DAC has a DDC inside. That is what the USB implementation is. It takes data from USB and it converts it to I2S. The Denifrips Hermes takes data from USB and converts it to I2S. The pi 2 as takes data over the network and converts it to I2S. I2S is the language that your DAC uses internally. You can see on the screen a quick illustration demonstrating what's actually in an I2S connection. There is a master clock, which determines the exact timing with which everything happens. There is a word clock, which basically says, hey, the data that's coming through is for the left channel, or the data that's coming through is for the right channel. And then there's the actual ones and zeros, the data contained from, from the file itself. With SPDIF, that is all encoded into one stream. So technically I2S I is superior just because there's no encoding or unpacking to do, and I'll show some measurements of that in a sec, but the key thing is that with any of those interfaces, your DAC is not the master clock. And that means instead of using the internal DDC, you can upgrade and replace it with something like this. So then, let's talk some hard numbers. Let's show some actual evidence that these are doing something. The first that I measured was just straight up optical from my PC, and it's bad. It's real bad. <laughs> Obviously there is no noise because it's just an optical connection, there's no electric electrical connection going on at all. This is just jitter. This is just awful levels of jitter, timing issues. Don't use optical from a PC, please. It's so bad. Then let's look at the shit eater. This is much better levels of performance. This is a USB to SPDIF converter. No issues whatsoever here with jitter performance. 
What then if we go to something even more expensive? The Shit Eater is a pretty affordable little device. The Denifrips Hermes is $1,000. This is a very expensive DDC. This was sent in to me by Andrew uh, from Headfly. Again, thank you very much. And you can see that, again, it is performing another level up. This is performing better than the Shit Eater. This has got some very expensive clocks, very nice power supply, lots of filtering, galvanic light. It's got everything you could possibly ask for. And Jitter performance is better. And again, nothing about the data has changed. This is just measuring differences in timing. That is all. None of these are measured from the digital output of these devices. It is measured from the May. These devices are feeding the May, and then I'm measuring it from the analog output of the DAC. These digital devices are having measurable effects on the analog output of the device. The data is the same, but because there are differences in timing, you can measure that difference on the analog final output of your DAC. And obviously, this is a low-level performance difference. An ITER or something is still going to give you fantastic performance, and in fact, most modern DACs have good USB implementations. I would note, however, that most DACs are tested in rather ideal conditions. If you're connecting it to an APX555 or a Raspberry Pi or something, that's giving the DAC a really good chance. Measurements won't always tell you how good a DAC is going to perform in the real world, just because they're very ideal conditions. But anyway, if you think that anything below minus 120 is inaudible, then that's fine. Just use USB with a Pi, get an ITER, something like that, and you're fine. But for the kind of person that just wants the best, that has 10 grand on their system and they want to spend a grand on a DDC, what can you do to push that further? Use I squared S. I squared S doesn't involve any kind of encoding or packing into one line. The clocks and the data have their own separate lines and it feeds the DAC directly. There is no conversion involved at any step. And that then leads to better jitter performance. On the left of the screen is the Hermes when connected via just coaxial SPDIF. And on the right is the performance when connected via I squared S. This is the same device running on the same clocks. It's just a different connection interface. And as you can see, it's better. So if your DAC and transport support I squared S, I would strongly recommend using it. From an objective standpoint, it is the best interface. Now, at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that this was originally going to be a review of the Denifrips Hermes. I like high-end audio. I like getting the best that you can. And sometimes you do have to spend a lot for that. Sometimes you have to spend quite a bit to get a fantastic DAC or a fantastic amp or fantastic headphones or whatever. There are a lot of cases where you do have to spend quite a bit. And spending much more on the Denifrips Hermes does get you better performance than something like a shit ITER, and will get you better performance than the inbuilt USB interface in most DACs. But the reason that I wanted to start talking about more DDCs is that then, when I was testing, I measured this as well. This is the Pi 2 AS. This is from Pi 2 Design, Michael Kelly. It's I've modified this one slightly. It normally accepts a 24 volt power supply. I've modified it to accept a 5 volt one. I'll have a video coming on just how to put one of these together because this is fantastic. I like this, but this is better. And I don't mean I like it better. I mean this little device, which costs $150 for the hat, measures better than this $1,000 DDC with li li linear power supply and oven controlled crystal oscillators and a billion capacitors for filtering, this measures better. On the left, you can see the I squared S performance for the Denifrips Hermes. And on the right, you can see the I squared S performance for the Pi 2 AES. I, there's not really any more that I have to say. This is objectively better than that. And this sounds slightly better to me subjectively. I don't understand it because that shouldn't happen. This this little device shouldn't be outperforming everything else. It, do, it doesn't make much sense. I have a slight theory, which is that this is one of the only devices where there is no USB involved in the chain at all anywhere. Straight network in, I squared S from the Pi, I squared S reclocked output here, I squared S into the DAC. There's no USB in the chain. Everything else has USB. This is USB. The DAC's internal USB is USB. That uses USB. This is the only device which has no USB in the chain. And no matter what USB source I use, be it the SMS200 Ultra, my PC, iFi iGalvanic, a Pi, this is the best performing digital output I could find. And this is $150. <laughs> 
And that makes me happy, because I love it when I can recommend something that's pretty affordable as being the best. And I yet to see a DDC which performs better than this. I would love to get a hold of something like uh, a DA DI20 HE. If you have a DI20 HE and you wouldn't mind me borrowing it for a bit, shoot me a DM on Discord because I really want to take a look at one of those. But this thing is crazy. This is fantastic. This measures better than that. It costs an eighth of the price. This now makes no sense whatsoever, other than the fact that it looks kind of cool. Hopefully this video cleared up a little bit about why digital to digital converters and digital sources in general make a difference. Electrical noise is the biggest enemy to an audio chain. Getting away from your PC, having it connected via a lower noise source rather than something with a honking fat GPU in it is the biggest thing you can do. And you can do that for 30 quid with a Raspberry Pi 3B+, that's all you need. Other than noise, improving jitter is a little bit of a more it depends question. Let's say that you've isolated your USB and everything. Some DACs like a Hollow May or Shit's Unison USB actually have fantastic USB inputs and the clock performance in those will be great. You don't really need any of this. But for a lot of DACs, that's not the case. And using an external DDC, which is of higher quality than the internal DDC in your DAC, will give you an improvement in terms of jitter performance. Just because bits arrive intact, it does not mean that the analog output result will be the same, because the time with which samples are converted makes a difference. Jitter makes a difference, and that's the thing which is so often misunderstood. And before you flood the comments, I'm not here claiming any level of audibility. If you are of the opinion that none of this mattered, then that's fine, use whatever you've got. There are only a couple studies on how audible jitter actually is, and there's two problems. The first is that those studies were done with uh, normal people, and without trying to sound pretentious, a, an average person off the street isn't going to be as attuned to the really minute differences in spatial presentation particularly, because that's what jitter affects most sound stage and imaging, as a mastering engineer or someone who has you know, spent 10 years being into hi-fi and is used to hearing the most minute difference. The average listener is going to have different hearing capabilities. That's the first issue with those studies. The second is that they don't talk about the type of jitter that's introduced. There are two types. There is random jitter and deterministic jitter. Random jitter, which you can see illustrated on the screen, is spread out and it presents itself almost like a noise floor. Deterministic jitter is the single spurs, the repeating predictable patterns of jitter. And these can be close to the fundamental or spread out. And I don't know how the differences between those impact our hearing. I know that there is a difference to my ears between that and that, and I know that that and that have different patterns of jitter. This is lower, but there's no real studies on it, and there's not really much financial incentive to do so, so we probably won't know for a while. If you just want the best, though, and you are happy to pay for it, you don't need to get that. You just need to spend $150 on a Pi 2AES. One more thing to mention. Some DACs do not have good SPDIF or AES inputs. This isn't all that common, but an example is the ship Modius. The Modius has a great USB input. It's not galvanically isolated, it won't filter noise. The big brother, the Bifrost 2, does have galvanic isolation, this does not. The jitter performance on the USB is great, and normally with most stacks, if you have an excellent source like a Pi 2 AES, you should use that, because that's going to be a great source. With the Modius though, and some other DACs, the SPDIF input adds too much jitter. Uh, you can see a measurement on screen at the moment. The SPDIF input for that DAC does not do as well as the USB. So sometimes it's worth checking just to make sure that the SPDIF input on your DAC is not bad. That's confirmed by Audio Science Review as well, by the way. You can have a look at their measurements if you don't trust mine. The SPDIF input on that is not great. Some DACs go the other way. The Hollow May. I'll talk about this more in the review for that. This has the best PLL or phase locked loop system you can get in any DAC currently. And what a phase locked loop system does is it attenuates jitter. It's not a buffer, it's not storing samples, it is just attenuating jitter from the source. As an example, on the left is the jitter coming out of the May with the PLL off when I'm feeding it optical from my PC, the worst source I could find. And on the right is when I turn the PLL on. Any jitter is just obliterated and my ADC is the limiting factor. I, it's so low I cannot possibly measure it. It's probably lower than what I'm seeing there, but I can't measure it. That's how good it is. Even from an absolutely awful source, with the PLL turned on, the jitter performance on that outclasses a, a dedicated DDC with oven control clocks and everything. 
it's nuts. A huge thank you to Andrew from Head5 for sending me the Denifrips Hermes to review. A huge thank you to all of my patrons for helping fund stuff like the ADI2 Pro and the Pi2 AES. You guys are fantastic, especially Daniel Mellinger, Lana Bennett, Chris, King Jung Un, and Ross Kyle, my Diamond and Legend tier patrons. You guys are legends. Hopefully you learned something. Come chat with me on Discord, and if you've got any questions about the content of this video, more than happy to discuss them. Until next time, have a great day.